Welcome once again to today's Pieces of Systematic Review with Margaret Foster, Session 2. I'm so pleased to have all of you with us uh, this afternoon, this morning, or whatever time it is, wherever you are. Uh, first off, I do want to introduce Margaret. Many of you may already be familiar with her. She is the Associate Professor at Texas A&M University and serves as the Systematic Reviews and Research Coordinator at the Medical Sciences Library with a joint position at the School of Public Health. Her work with Systematic Reviews began more than a decade ago while completing her Master's of Public Health. In her current position, she provides consultations for researchers in medicine, public health, veterinary medicine, education, and other disciplines, and has published over 30 articles applying or describing systematic review methods and evidence-based practices. In addition, she is a co-founder of the Medical Library Association Systematic Review Special Interest Group and has developed a popular continuing education course about systematic reviews, which has trained over 1,000 librarians. We are so pleased to have her in our South Central region, partnering us once again for the Pieces 2.0 series. Take it away, Margaret. Oh, so thank you. I keep thinking maybe we can make my introduction shorter because I have so many slides today. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, today we're going to be looking, uh, take a closer look at the search, um, developing and documenting your search. Um, and one thing I wanted to say about today's session is we're not going to cover all of the search. Um, because you really do some searching throughout the whole process. So today we're going to be focusing on the database search itself and mostly on Medline. So um, this is just my contact information and um, the book that Sarah and I wrote. Um, so I'd just like to put that slide in there. Um, this is a, a general overview of the way that we set up this um, second series. Um, so today we're focusing on identify, um, and then our next session we're going to look, um, take a closer look at evaluating um, the search results, and then also part of that will be some expanded search techniques, um, and then we'll go from there. So this is a quick overview of the agenda. Um, so I want to give a little recap of what we talked about last time and then um, also answer some questions that I got in the mean, uh, in between. Um, and then we'll get into a quick lecture. And I say quick lecture, but I, I have many more slides than I did last time. Um, so just a, an overview of some of the standards of searching. And um, throughout this, I hope to do question and answer, but I'll make sure that I pause there. And then we'll look at our two case studies, um, looking at what the researchers said back and then what I did in response to that. Um, and then we'll do a wrap up. Um, so a quick a recap of what we did last time. Um, we looked at um, that first interview that you have with a client and what are the, uh, the steps to determine if that project is feasible. Um, does this make sense? Um, also, I want to take a quick look again at the different types of questions that a systematic review. Um, and then I had some questions about rayon, so I will talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we'll talk about it some more, especially next time as well. Um, this time we'll just talk kind of briefly about it. So last time when we were talking about um, determining if a project is feasible for a review, um, these are the five steps we talked about it. So first, we talked about trying to figure out uh, which review method is the right um, type for um, the question, and then working on framing and scoping that question. Um, so when I talk about scope, I'm thinking about how are we going to frame the question. So um, sometimes that's PICO, sometimes that's other frames. And then what is the eligibility criteria? Um, I don't want to do a lot of work on the search until um, that question and that eligibility criteria is really finalized. Um, but of course, I need to give them something because you can't do that work in a vacuum. Um, and so last time we had given um, the client 20 articles to kind of start sorting and trying to apply their criteria that they come up with. 
Um, the other part that I work on with them is trying to figure out, has somebody already done this, and how does that relate to what they're trying to do? Um, they also, many times, they want to know, well, how long is this going to take me? So you really want to um, estimate the number of potential citations that are out there, because um, that's going to be the best indicator of how long do you think this is going to take. Um, some review questions are so broad, and, they, um, and there's been so much written about it, or the topic itself is very, um, has so many other ways of talking about it that you have to look through thousands and thousands, and sometimes it's a very small group. Um, and so lastly, putting all that together, coming up with, um, is, is this really going to be feasible given your resources and your time and um, their objective? Um, so those are the steps that I go through that we demonstrated last time. Um, in the, between um, the last um, webinar and this one, I found this article and I thought it was really nice um, table um, of laying out the different types of systematic review questions and especially helpful since they gave the review type, the aim, the format, and the example. Um, and so I thought this was really helpful because so many times we're kind of stuck with um, always trying to turn everything into a PICO question, um, and sometimes it doesn't quite make sense for the question. Um, the two that I have done the most often has been effectiveness, and then um, on this list, it's the etiology or risk. And so instead of having a PICO, then you have the PEO. Um, and so you see the example there of, are adults exposed to radon at risk for developing lung cancer? So those kinds of risk factors questions I get a lot from my public health graduate students and faculty. Um, but I have done at least one of all of these different questions. So that's definitely growing in popularity to branch out and, and work on other types of questions. And so hopefully um, this will help you as well in trying to help people to frame those questions. Um, and so my last slide in the recap is talking a little bit more about rayon. Um, so I, I had a lot of questions about that. Um, I even had a few phone calls that I didn't, unfortunately, be able to get back to. Um, February is my busiest month of the year. So many, I'm sure many of you experienced that as well at the beginning of the semester. Lots of classes to teach. Um, so a few things about Rayon. Um, first, there are lots of other products out there. Um, I have used Covidence. I've looked at Distiller. I've tried other um, products. Um, I'm not particularly tied to Rayon. Um, I, I'm always on the lookout for something that's going to be helpful. Um, I have used Rayon a lot in the last um, two years, and um, many people, once they have tried it out, they do like it. Um, but I, I don't think there's any one best thing. You have to find what works for you. I'm using this um, tool as an example here because it's free um, and it works on big projects and small projects. And it has a fairly very low learning curve. It doesn't take a long time to use it. Some of the questions that I got were around the idea of copyright. And I didn't actually know the answer to the question myself, so um, I went and I found Rayon's link um, into their terms, and so you can see more about that there. I know that Rayon has, pub um, as a group, that um, they have published several articles about testing and research on their own product, and they've done demonstrations at several um, Cochrane um, symposiums and things like that. Um, so I think, you know, any tool that's out there, you, you, there's going to be um, different questions about it. Is it going to work? And um, I just, you know, there's other products that are out there. Um, so um, anyway, so I put this list here um, about um, how I, when I'm working with somebody, I create a folder in there. Um, I'll download the citations from the database. Usually I just do that as an RAS because that's kind of a, 
a general one that almost all of them can export in. I try and name that batch, then I invite that researcher so they can create their own count. Um, and then um, I talk with them about how to use it and customize things. And that's all in that pre-reading um, handout. Um, I have some things in there. We'll talk next week more about how you can um, divide um, citations into batches, depending if it's a bigger work group or not. Um, so when it's a small group, it's just two or three. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, when you're getting into bigger groups, you might have to have different ways of batching things. So, okay. Um, so our objectives for this session is at the end of this, um, hopefully you'll be able to describe um, developing a systematic review search, see a couple of tools that are out there, um, know about the standards um, that are out there for the search. We're going to talk about the standards a little bit here. We're going to do even more um, during our next session when we talk about um, expanded searches, because that's where you see even more of the standards coming in. Um, and then we'll do a little bit about the evaluation of the search, and then we'll get into, here's some examples for the two case studies that we have. Um, so, um, so pretty much going over everything that I was going to have on this slide, so pretty much covered it there, okay. Um, so. Something that sometimes I have to talk with my client about is what makes this search different than other searches that they've done. So many times when people um, think about searching in the library, they, they kind of do this circular thing um, where they kind of look a little over here and a little over there, or they keep going back to the same database and conducting different searches, adding a few more keywords, different things. Um, and when they're doing that, they start getting frustrated a little bit because, of course, they get a lot of duplicates. And, they, and sometimes they don't know how to get out of that. Um, so one thing that I talked to them about is how we're going to develop a search plan based on their criteria, and we're going to do one database at a time. Um, sometimes they think, well, why don't you just search across all of them at the same time? So then I have to talk about um, how each database is structured in a different way. Um, and how to be as comprehensive as we can is to go um, um, through that database and, and its options there. Um, also, we want to be comprehensive with the search. Uh, the goal is to minimize bias, um, and we definitely need to document the search very well and uh, copy-paste everything. Um, there are guidelines for the search. Recently, um, Cochrane has updated them, so if you haven't looked at them for a little bit, um, the one for Cochrane, I have a picture of it here, is the MECOR standards. Um, and then one quotation that I uh, use, one quote from there that I use a lot, is that searches for studies should be as extensive as possible in order to reduce the risk of publication bias and identify as much relevant evidence as possible. Um, so there's a lot of wiggle room in there. <laughs> um, you know, what do you mean by extensive things like that? Um, and the sister um, organization with Campbell, uh, with Cochrane, is the Campbell Collaboration, and this group has taken the MECOR and um, adapted it for um, nutrition and education and other groups. And uh, they use a very similar acronym. Um, the CC is just Campbell Collaboration in there. Um, and you'll see the same um, quote in there as well. So these are the steps that I'm going to talk about for developing the search. And along the way, um, I put in um, potentially different tools and different things that you might think about. Um, step one being, I want to know if somebody else done this. Um, second, I, I want to start listing out the databases. I might not have it perfectly decided at this point, but I'm definitely talking with the researcher about that list and what we're planning on. Um, then we'll get into uh, the search terms, designing the search, evaluating, documenting, and then just a little bit about translating. We'll do even more about that next week as well. 
So when I want to go and look at um, some related searches, you know, you don't want to invent the wheel. Uh, I want to look at those related reviews that we talked last week, uh, last time about collecting those. Um, I might go and look at a Cochrane review on that topic, see what they have. And then there's also a tool called the Yale Mesh Analyzer um, that I find very helpful. Um, many times um, when I'm also thinking about the topic uh, that we're going to be searching on, sometimes a search filter I think will be really helpful. So um, there's a database of search filters available from this um, ISSG group. Um, which you can see the, oh, the acronym spelled out there. And so they collect search filters. And many times these search filters have to do with types of methods. So there are filters for if you wanted to just find systematic reviews or randomized control trials, things like that. Um, a few others have been popping up. So I've seen some just for geography. I know there was a group from Spain that developed one to find all the reviews in Medline um, about Spain, um, the adverse effects ones I've used a lot. Um, so this is a great place to go and check to see are there any filters related to one of the criteria that you might be thinking about. Um, and you're looking for one that was designed specifically for the database and the interface that you're going to search um, because that's hopefully that's where it's been tested and hopefully it's been validated as well. Um, sometimes I have to take one and then adapt it a little bit um, because um, like sometimes there's one for observational studies and maybe they don't want all the different types of observational studies, but I can take a part of it. So, and of course I always want to give them credit for that. Um, the, the other tool is the Yale Mesh Analyzer. Um, this is a great tool, especially if when your client comes, they already have um, a list of articles that they know they uh, want to include. Um, or maybe um, after you give them a few, a set of 20 to 50 articles to sort through, they come back with some. So this is completely free. It can analyze up to 20 uh, PubMed IDs. So it uh, only works on um, PubMed articles. Um, and then what you get when you do this is, um, oh, I will show you what you get when you use that when we get to one of the case studies where I did that. So uh, here I just mentioned the tool and then um, we'll talk, we'll do an example in a minute. I forgot I didn't put that in here. Okay. Um, so of course we also start listing the database and sometimes they'll come to you and they'll already have a list. Um, Sometimes when people will list out their database, they'll list things like ScienceDirect um, or other vendors like that. I discourage people from searching vendors uh, or publishers that way um, just because, well, you'd want to search all the vendors so you, or publishers so you're not limiting down to anyone. But for the most part, I just discourage people from doing that. I w would rather look at um, subject-based databases or um, or other types that are like that. Um, so I want to start with the most relevant databases. I also think about, is this an interdisciplinary topic? Um, what are the different disciplines that might be talking about it? Things like that. Um, hopefully I can encourage them not to limit down to just uh, peer-reviewed. Um, and so I also might think about the other types of um, resources that that database indexes. Um, and then of course, you know, we all kind of have our favorites. So um, I know many systematic review librarians that love to uh, that search PubMed for reviews. My preferred way is Medline Ovid. So my examples I'm gonna show you come from there. Um, but it, the main thing to be aware of is what are the differences between the interfaces and what might you have to consider or think about if you're searching one over the other. Um, and um, we'll get into the specifics of the case studies here. Um, so we'll do some examples of these. Um, so the next thing is when you're thinking about the search criteria. Um, and one thing that Cochrane 
um, suggests, and this is based over all the different searching that they've done, um, is you want to make sure that for each concept you're going to include, that you look for keywords, you or those with appropriate thesaurus terms, and you're trying to collect all the articles on that concept. And so I do that for each um, concept that I'm going to include. Um, and this can sometimes um, take a little bit of time. Um, you also want to think up about the structure of the search. So what, which of the criteria should you include in the search? This is a suggestion from Cochrane, and so they, remembering that they only focus on effectiveness questions, um, so they will include the health condition um, or pop, and or population, the intervention, and then the study design. Um, so this works great when you have an effectiveness question. There are times, for example, when I'm doing the type where we're looking at risk factors, where including the outcome is also helpful. And so our case study two is, is one of those um, type. Um, but I do like to go over and, and talk about that that's what um, Cochrane would like to see, so that if you are working on a, an effectiveness question, it's important to know that's what Cochrane expects. Um, so just a few things that I think about when I'm collecting terms. Um, I do think um, what are the different ways of the different disciplines that are possible or fields that are talking about that concept, how might they refer to something. Um, for example, when you're thinking about just the concept of children, depending um, which field you're in, you may talk about children in different ways. So like in education, they would describe where they're at in school, so first graders, primary school, high school, um, but if you're in medicine, you talk about them, their stage of development, so a child, adolescent, things like that. Um, then if you want to make sure that you're collecting things um, a, as globally as you can, then you think about variations in either spelling of different things, so we know like pediatrics can be spelled differently, anesthesiology, um, but also, different ways they might refer to the same topic. Um, I know I recently was trying to get an article published in a British journal, and um, they wanted me to change the term daycare to childcare, and I hadn't even thought about that, as um, daycare was not a term that was very familiar to them. Um, so there's different things like that where it really helps to read a few articles that have been published outside the US so you can see how they're referring to your concept. This is something you might, it might take a little bit and you might not know perfectly in the beginning. Um, so I, I don't like to hold up the whole process because of these. So as other terms come up, I might pour them into the search and see, okay, how many new things did we get because we did that? Um, and it just depends on how you run your service. That's how I, I work on this in the beginning because we develop our protocol in these first several meetings. By the time we get to the fourth or fifth meeting, everything is, is very much set, and we've developed the search um, together with, uh, with the team. Um, so just a little bit about um, looking for the thesaurus terms. Of course, um, we've got Medline, um, thesaurus terms in Medline, and Embase, Eric also has terms like info. Um, so whenever there are the source terms available, I'm always going to look at them. Um, it is important to um, go and look at what happens when you're going to cook explode and know um, what terms are going to be included there. Um, sometimes I'll verify the scope note with them. Sometimes this can be tricky because the scope that's listed in Medline may, um, may not match perfectly with your researchers definition of a topic, but you know that for that topic, that's what they're going to, that's what it will be labeled as. So it's, it's never going to be like a perfect definition. We're just trying to grab all the ones that might be relevant. Or, um, and, and this is something where you kind of have to play with it because you, you don't want to get a lot of noise or things that are irrelevant, but it's something you kind of play with. So I kind of talk them through um, that idea. Yeah, Ovid is, Ovid is my favorite interface, too. It's the one I learned um, Medline with. Um, I have put this little star in here because this is your sh chance to really shine and, 
and use all the bells and whistles of the database. So um, I use proximity when it makes sense. So I, sh I put some examples here, um, wild cards, I'm phrase searching, anything that I can use to help me um, design a search and be efficient with it. So um, one of the searches that I did was about computer addiction. Um, and so we found that there would be lots of different words in between. Um, I actually think we had to go up from just being adjacent within two words to adjacent within three or four words. So um, I think everybody has their kind of different rule about how many words are we going to allow in between. Um, I usually don't go higher than three or four, um, and sometimes I'll just do one word in between. Um, I kind of play with it a little bit to see what seems to be appropriate in there. And then when you're doing your limits, um, I, wa I always want to think about those very carefully. And am I kicking something out because of something that I did? Um, it's always OK to leave off limits. Um, but you might be making, uh, it might be more efficient to add them. So it's something that I, I think about a, and kind of test a little bit to make sure that it's going to work out well. So I'm just going to talk about four different limits that you might think about. Um, so study type, we kind of talked about that um, earlier when we talked about looking at previous um, searches. So um, you only want to do this really with those um, study types where there's some validated filters out there. For example, um, I work a lot with people in health promotion, and one thing that they try to get me to add to a search is um, the concept or just the, like the term intervention. Uh, the problem is, is that there's many health promotion interventions out there where they never say the word intervention or program. So that concept of just intervention itself is just too, is too broad. Is, it's both broad and too specific. So if you and in that concept and you just say intervention or program, you just knocked out a bunch of stuff that are potentially those things. Um, so that's a tricky thing. Age it can also be tricky. Um, and one of the trickiest is actually adult. Um, because many times when people write their abstract, uh, when they have looked at adults, um, you'll kick out a bunch of things if you just say, um, all of your concepts and adult, you'll kick out a bunch of stuff that, that was never labeled as adult or doesn't have that term in there. So I tried to show you a little um, search hedge that I'll use. So I'll take my concepts and I'll say and adult either as title abstract or as a mesh heading. Um, and then I'll also take all my concepts and say not children. Um, and then I'll the group that I want is either of those situations. So either they do mention adult or they're not mentioning children. Um, that way I'm trying to get the best of both worlds too. We do a similar thing when we're trying to limit down to humans um, because one of the, the most commonly left off tags in Medline is the human tag. Um, so but they always remember to label the animals um, articles for the most part. Um, so the um, what you add according to Cochrane um, is you will say um, your search and then you'll say not animals, but if it's just animals and humans, you want that. So that's why you see this line that says not animals, not humans. I um, would bring that in with my search. Um, so I don't have to do that on a lot of searches that I do. Because um, sometimes just the nature of the search, there will be no animal studies out there. But those that I definitely know, oh, a bunch of animal stuff will come up, I will do that. The other thing is this will not work um, on articles that, that has no mesh headings yet. So even though it's about animals, it has no mesh headings, so it's, it's still going to come through your search. Um, and that's where a tool like Rayon can help because I could easily search through my results and say, show me all the ones that say rats or mice, and I can um, exclude those quickly. Um, the year limit is an interesting thing um, because Cochrane and, um, says that it would like there to be a reason why you selected a certain time period that you don't just say, oh, I'm just going to do the last 10 years. Of course, many, many reviews have been published that 
that's what they um, say. But um, there are different reasons why you might select a certain date. So it's because a policy changed, um, surveillance rules changed, the last review was done however many years ago, whatever it is. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. But like I said, I see many things published where they never really justify the years. It's just something um, that Cochrane does ask for. Um, so when I'm trying to review and modify my search, I'm sometimes if they come with three or four studies, I'll design my search and then I'll test it against there. Um, but there's this part in the beginning where I'm kind of going through this process of what, what do you have? What did you find? Is my search bringing that up? Um, and we're going to come back to this again when we get to um, session four, because that's when they will have gone through everything that I've given them, and then we'll do some more evaluation to see how did we do. Um, it's really good to have at least one other person look at your search. Um, and one way that they can, or one rubric they can do in looking at your search is um, the press. Um, I think many of y'all have seen it. Um, press, um, I think it's been a few years ago, a few years since they've updated and they made a few less criteria. Um, this is a great tool to give um, structured feedback to somebody because you can highlight just one uh, one issue using this. Um, and it's nice on their website. They will um, go through examples and show what they're looking for. It's great if you could have a little cohort, whether um, it's within your library or between a few libraries. Um, I think the hardest part with this is sometimes people treat their search a little bit like it's their baby. Uh, they don't want to show other people their search. Um, but it is good if you uh, can get yourself out of that and share it. Um, and it's been great for me because um, I can think I, I just typed too fast and I misspelled things. Um, and sometimes the researcher doesn't catch it. So it's great to have somebody else look at it. Um, when you are documenting your search, there are seven elements that are good to record somewhere. Um, and so these are um, the ones that Cochrane looks for, and I would say that this is just, you know, good um, standard to record these. So you need the name, the host, the date of the search, years you covered. And I just want to copy paste that search somewhere. I do search of it a lot, so I do save my searches in there. Um, but now I have a list in my um, Save search area. I think I have like 500 things in there. So then I had to come up with a naming mechanism and things like that. And even though I do all of that and save it in there, I still copy paste it and put it somewhere else just in case. Um, while Ovid has never lost a search, EBSCO has lost searches for me. Um, so I just I've just started the habit of copy pasting it somewhere else. If for some reason I can't save it within the database. Um, of course, then I have to copy paste it and save it somewhere else anyways. Um, sometimes I have to do print screens or other things, just anything I can to record what did we do. Um, sometimes people will say, oh, um, you need to make, it needs to be reproducible. And that's a great standard to try and reach. Um, the main thing that I look for when I'm looking at a search is, um, did you give me enough information so I can evaluate it for myself? I may not be able to replicate it because I don't have access to that database, but um, I do need to understand it enough so I can decide was that the right thing to do. Um, and then I always just say rinse and repeat. So when you're moving from one database to another, you keep all the keywords the same as much as you can. You'll, you're going to have to change the thesaurus terms. And then sometimes, of course, you also have to change um, the syntax and things like that, because some databases don't have proximity searching or whatever it is. Um, we're going to do even more about this um, during our next session, um, but I just put this in here as part of this process. OK, so um, let's see if you have any questions. Um, let's see. Save the results as a PDF. OK. So, um, so I think that's great as long as you can copy paste it if you need it. Um, 
but it, as long as you have some way of, of saving it, I think that's really helpful. I know for some of you that was maybe just a refresher, maybe I, I went on too long. Um, just let me know if you have other questions. We'll look at this case study and then we'll do talk a, through um, the search for this one using some of those um, techniques and examples. Um, so in this case study, this is where they are potentially looking at doing a scoping review. Um, and last time we talked about going um, different ways with this. Um, and so here in this beginning, this is where your researcher may change their criteria as you're going along. And so like I said, I never settle and, and work a whole bunch on that search until they are really settled. And that's where working on the protocol um, can um, really help. Um, so let's see, if you use Ovid Medline, you should also search in PubMed. So uh, I think it can depend on which Ovid Medline you have. I know ours it includes the, e, um, the ones that haven't been indexed as well. So I don't, um, I don't search PubMed in addition. Um, the one thing that PubMed does not have that Ovid has is you can't do proximity searching in it, um, which for some topics can be really inefficient. Um, but, but I did used to do that. I did used to search both of them. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it depends on how up to date. So I'm always going to update my search along the way. Um, usually every three to four months, something like that. Um, but yeah, that's a good point too. Um, so in this search, they were not sure exactly uh, what they wanted to cover. So they're looking at diabetes, adolescence, and depression. And last time we talked about, um, they were trying to decide, did they want to do depression or just focus on suicide? So we kind of went back and forth on that. Um, and so when I'm thinking about their project, I'm thinking, well, how did their sorting go? Did they find things that were useful in there? Did they change the eligibility criteria um, from what they're telling me that I'm going to need to update the search? Um, and then we'll talk about um, what they need to do um, after the meeting. So I'll usually open up um, the uh, their rayon folder and I'll kind of see like what's what did you do in here? Um, and so here I see, okay, you marked five things. Um, sometimes if they were doing a systematic review, then I would go through those five things and I would be looking to see, are these actual studies? Are they all over the place? And a scoping review because you are including, um, you have a wider range of um, article types that you're looking for. Um, I'm not looking for that in particular. Um, so I see, okay, they, they've marked five things, ask them how it went. Um, and then I also ask them, do you have any articles that you've already collected that will match um, your, um, your topic? Um, I also want to look at any previous reviews that have been published on that topic to see um, how did they search, where did they search, that kind of thing. So for this topic, um, this is one of the reviews that we found. And so um, at their searches, um, it's sad, but it's kind of typical what, what we would see. So you see there's not a lot to the search. Um, so they tell me, oh, we also added in best terms and entry terms. Um, they don't really um, tell me what it was. Um, and then I see like for children and adolescent, they didn't have a lot of um, synonyms for, the, for that topic, um, nor for depression. Um, if they just searched diabetes mellitus in this way, they may have missed um, several articles because sometimes you'll just see that they were, they'll just say diabetes or they'll say diabetics. So by searching this, if they really did search this as a key phrase, as a phrase this way, I know that they will have missed many things. 
And um, this was another review that we found. Um, so um, this one was a little harder to read what they did because they they combined the Medline, the Embase, the Cochrane, and the PsycInfo, which they spelled wrong, um, searches all in one by and telling me, okay, here's all the ways that we searched for diabetes. Here's all the way we searched for children. And then under each one, we have the different databases there. So this took me a while of reading. Um, so the, the thing that I got from here um, was that, and as interesting is that they were also searching um, keywords in other languages. So I found that um, very interesting. Um, and then I could also see, um, let's see. They, they were, and of course, this search is slightly different from what we're trying to do. Um, it's interesting that they ended in behavior disorders in there, even though that didn't seem to be what they were um, exactly focusing on, because they were looking at anxiety and they put behavior in there. Um, anyways, so I, I will go through this. I'll see is there anything in here that can help me that I should add into my search. Um, and I'll talk with the researcher about what, what it here seems like it would be helpful to them. Um, and I also start listing out the databases. Of course, for this topic, um, Medline, Embase, we've got to search PsycInfo, um, CINAHL, and then um, potentially Central as well. Although, probably for this topic, there aren't that many randomized control trials out there, but I would still try Central. And then as I can get the researcher to search other non-peer-reviewed places, conferences, and dissertations and things. So I'm starting to build up with them um, what they're expecting, um, making my suggestions, getting the list going. Um, and by the end of our, our, this webinar series, we'll have um, that kind of completed list there. So this is that still beginning stages. And then as we're thinking through um, building their search, I'm starting to think about what are the main concepts that we're going to be searching for. So this one is teens, diabetes, and depression. Um, as I was working with the person, we went back and forth on whether or not to or in suicide with this. Um, and so it was something that as we go through, I will show you kind of over the course what happened. Um, but we went back and forth on that one. Um, so this was like my, my first kind of draft with them um, was um, they wanted to focus on adolescents. So we have got those terms. We ended up oring in pediatrics because we had seen a few things that it were just labeled with pediatrics. So I went ahead and put that in there. Um, and then we also started to think, well, maybe they could refer to them, um, their grade, they're in at school, things like that. Um, and so you can hopefully, um, as you look over this, you can see um, that we didn't we didn't have a lot of terms for the depression part. Um, we thought we would build that up. At, as they were still trying to decide whether or not they wanted to include the concept of suicide in this list. Um, and so then I tried to kind of demonstrate the concepts here with these circles and these plus signs, because I wanted to show you one of the techniques to see um, what terms might you be potentially missing from here. So um, from this, I got around 1,000 results for the last 10 years. Um, and then so my next step was to kind of start to test this. Um, oh, let's see, what about the MESH term depressive um, disorder? Yeah, so the technique I'm going to show is one that um, is going to show what to, um, how to see, um, and hopefully that's going to come out. Um, so let me, I think, demonstrate this part. Um, okay. So I learned, uh, I first saw Vicor Brommer do this a few years ago. And so um, I don't necessarily do this on every search that I do, but it, I thought I would demonstrate it for y'all, um, how it, um, its potential for being helpful. Um, so I did put the citation um, from JMLA where he has this, and I've seen him do this demonstration of this technique. Um, 
several times. So the technique is basically to test your keywords and the mesh headings to see, are you missing? What are you missing? So I tried to use the circles here to kind of demonstrate um, what you're seeing in the numbers here. So I hope that this makes sense and I can explain it well. Um, so the, the first, um, the, my first thing that I wanted to test was do I have all the right um, keywords in the title and abstract for the concept of teens or adolescents? So I took um, my, my mesh headings for the teen, I ended that with all the terms for depression, um, oh, the last one should say diabetes, and all the, all the diabetes terms. And then I say not the current list of keywords I have for teens. Um, and so the idea is um, I'm looking at the results for any other potential keywords for that. So I hope that that makes sense. Maybe it will make more sense when, I, when we look at the next screen. Um, so these are some of the results that I saw. Okay. Um, and so I noticed that some coming up, they were about um, teens, but they used the word child or children. And so then I was like, oh, I need to, I need to bring in um, child and then um, when, um, as a keyword. And then when they screen, they can make sure, is it about the age that they want? Um, and then I had to look at the younger adults idea and figure out, um, are they referring to the teens that we're looking for as younger adults? Um, and try and figure out, is, does it make sense to add that? So that's something that I worked with the researcher and we kind of talked through that. So in that way, you can work through um, the different sets of keywords and you can also work through the um, mesh headings in this way. Um, so um, to test this, then I, I looked at, okay, um, I added in those new terms and then I would see how many um, results did I get back. So um, it seems like that was a better thing to do to add in that, that keyword of child. I was getting things back about teenagers that um, they referred to them as children, so that was helpful. So I hope I hope these circles and things are kind of helping. Um, I've tried to kind of demonstrate this in different ways, and I, I you know, um, Vikor does a very good job of, of doing this, and especially if you're in um, a session with him and you can kind of try this out, you can see it too. Um, I find it really helpful. So in this case, this was a more, um, an easier concept to think about. I find it really helpful on concepts that I'm really having a hard time for, uh, a hard time with. So I wanted to show it with an easier idea. Um, so um, in this one, let's see. This one I was looking for potential more um, teen, uh, any mesh headings dealing with teens. So in this case, instead of the keywords, I'm looking for mesh headings. Um, that would have been helpful, I think, on this case, especially, um, I just want to answer that person that was asking about uh, the other mesh heading for the depressive one. Um, I should have shown you this with the depressive one because you would have seen that that, that does get revealed um, using these um, steps. Um, so in this case, um, when I looked at it, um, it seemed like we were doing well. Um, I didn't see any new tags popping up this way. And so like I said, I don't necessarily apply this to every concept that I'm going to do. But for those concepts where I'm worried about it or I'm thinking about it, then I, I will go ahead and do this technique. Um, I think it's especially helpful in an area where I haven't done a lot of searching and I don't have a search hedge built up for that or I couldn't find anything. Um, I think it's especially helpful when that's happening. Um, so I hope that that, that kind of helps um, demonstrating that. And like I said, that um, I put that article in there. I was, um, I hadn't thought about adding that technique into this webinar before I, I put together the pre-reading list. So I'll make sure that I add it to um, next time as well. Um, so in, in talking with a client during this meeting, um, we were talking about their scope. They were kind of waffling back and forth about whether or not they wanted to include that concept of suicide or not. Um, 
And so one thing that I talked with them about during, uh, at the end of the meeting was that we really needed to kind of settle on their scope and, and they also had more questions about what is, what is a protocol, um, what is a scoping review, like how do you write that up kind of thing. So Prisma now has um, a standard for reporting scoping reviews. Um, so I like to give this um, either during the first meeting or the second meeting with my client um, so that they start knowing like what's going to be expected from them. Um, and then I also suggest to them when, they, when they're kind of waffling with something is to um, start thinking about their coding or their data abstraction form. That's something that we're going to talk about much more in our last webinar. Um, but at this stage, what I ask them to think about is, let's say that you have five studies right now that you want to include. What data would you collect from those studies? Sometimes that really helps them to to um, if they think about what they're going to do with what we're collecting, to really think about what they want to collect. Um, because their goal when they started off doing this project was not to sort thousands of articles, it was to answer their question. Um, so by, by asking them to think about it and start to draft it, it sometimes will help them to come up with a better list to report to you. Um, so let's see. And the questions at the beginning, do you have them develop a PICO query? So yes, so part of the, what we talked about last time was a lot about structuring the question. Um, but, and so what I'm trying to demonstrate here is even though they walk in my office and they could have perfectly structured their question, um, sometimes they don't do that in the best way or they don't realize how much would, you, would they have to go through if that's how they structured their question. Um, so this is, um, I'm trying to demonstrate with these case studies how sometimes um, how you're searching and, and what you're giving them, you kind of go, will go back and forth. Um, before we're done going through these case studies, we'll have a, a fully developed all, all the different parts of, of it. So I hope that helps. Um, so this is just a, a quick kind of screenshot of the checklist that you will see um, from Prisma. And you'll see it's not drastically different from what we see for Prisma for systematic review. Um, you still have the, hey, put scoping review in the title, um, have the structured abstract, give us your rationale, your objectives. Um, one of the main things that's different um, is going to be um, most of the time they're not going to do a critical appraisal, so like number 12. Um, 13, when they're talking about synthesis, you'll never see like a meta-analysis usually in these. Uh, it's going to be more um, descriptive, tables, things like that. Um, so, so you see that it's not a lot different from what you would do in a systematic review, so helping somebody do a scoping review is not terribly different. Um, most of the time a big difference is, is that their question is just broader and so usually they get back many more articles than you would normally see in a systematic review. Um, but they're, they're not going to go as in-depth on each um, study. And so you'll see much more of the differences when we get to um, session four between what's going to happen with these case studies. Okay. Um, so do you have any questions about scoping reviews before we, before we move on to the other case study? Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and put up the um, the next case study. Um, so um, this was a graduate student, and they're working with Dr. So and So, um, and this is the one where they were looking at physical activity, um, and they wanted to look at the correlation between physical activity and depression 
specifically in diabetic patients. Um, and then so they gave me some different questions that they have. Um, and um, one thing that you'll see sometimes when people are presenting their question to you, sometimes they start, they're in their question, you see what they want to code things on. So in this case, that's what I'm seeing when I look at, um, we really wanted to focus on how physical activity is measured and what the correlation between physical activity and depression is for this group. So really their overall question, if I was going to categorize this, um, is that risk factor um, type of question, so it's the PEO. Um, and then when they're um, talking about, oh, we wanted to focus on physical activity measures, then that's something that they're gonna code for, and it can be one of their objectives, but it may not be like their main question. And sometimes like when you get um, a systematic review question and they'll list like a whole bunch of questions, many of their sub questions have to do more with what information they're gonna code than it has to do with their overall question. And so I was trying to represent um, that situation with this case study. Um, so you see um, very similar thing. Um, how did their sorting go? Um, did they change anything? Um, and then looking at the search again. Um, and then what should they do after our meeting? Um, so when I looked at this group, um, I had given them, I think, 20, 21 items, um, and they only marked two to be included. Um, and so, um, and so this, um, so then I'll kind of look through this. And when I looked at this one, I said, oh, um, this one is talking about metabolic syndrome. Are you going to include things that are about that? Um, and so I, I talked with them about how they're setting their criteria. And if they wanted to also include this, then we might have to change the search to also include that. Um, unless they could tell the difference in here between the patients with diabetes and that. So we kind of have to talk about definitions and making sure um, that they have a very clear criteria because um, I have to, of course, understand exactly what they're looking for so I can make the best suggestions for them. So that's one re the, um, that's another reason to look at what they're marking in here in the beginning, because it's gonna give you a better idea of what they're thinking about um, that maybe they haven't said or written down. I find um, that looking at what they've marked in here is the most helpful for me in understanding um, how they're thinking about it. So after I look at this and I, I talk with them about what they're thinking about, um, here's that example I, I said I would show you um, um, from the Yale Mesh Analyzer. So they came to me and they had some articles already. So I went and I found their PubMed ID and I pasted it into the um, Mesh Analyzer. And so um, what that does is it's analyzing the, sub, the Mesh headings. So I see a nice, um, I see them all alphabetized and I can see across um, similar ones and things um, that maybe I hadn't thought about. So, um, so all of them are, are um, labeled with diabetes. They're all labeled um, except for the first one with depression. Um, so that's where having a um, searching for the very first one, of course, we wouldn't get that if we were just depending on depression as a mesh heading. Um, and, um, here, surprisingly, all of them are labeled with adult. You don't always see that. Um, one thing that this um, group, that this um, research group was looking for is they mostly wanted cross-sectional studies. And you could see that only two of the articles that they gave me were labeled with that, even though the first two were cross-sectional studies. So, um, so I know that I've got to make sure, I've got to look in there and see what are other ways I could get to those articles if it's not that. Um, there's not really a great search hedge for cross-sectional studies. I've had to kind of cobble one together 
Um, I'm happy to share that with anybody who wants to see. Um, it's mostly a lots of ores and um, was built up over the process of doing this. Um, and the main thing was there's so much out there on diabetes um, that we were just uh, um, getting so much back that we were struggling with should we put cross-sectional in as um, part of our search or not. Um, so that was one thing that I was kind of using this um, to help me decide as well. Um, so the Yale Mesh Analyzer can analyze up to um, 20 um, articles. Um, you can have it display it on a web page, or many times what I do is I have it, uh, I download it as a spreadsheet, which you can do directly um, from this tool. So it's a very nice tool. Um, and I find it to be really helpful if I'll go to a meeting with my client and show them this. Um, it helps them to start to realize um, how searching isn't as straightforward as maybe they imagined it was. So um, then uh, we did have this um, one um, article that we found, a review that we found that was related. Um, it was focused on uh, effectiveness of interventions, but it had some potential terms in here. Um, and so uh, I talked with um, the researcher about this one. The one that they put in here that I thought wasn't super helpful was um, in the second paragraph here towards the bottom. Um, they had just that um, throwaway term, I call it, of program, programs, intervention. Um, I just don't think that that helps very much. And also, it doesn't get at the concept of exercise. If you just say intervention, or it, they even have therapy or therapies in there. Um, so I thought, you know, you can see definitely a lot of work went into this search. Um, but I think that they did go a little bit overboard. Sometimes the reason why people include um, terms like this is because they'll find like one abstract where they're going to include that article and um, all that the article put in the abstract was program. And so they say, oh, I don't want to miss any that are like this, so I'll add program in there. Um, and, and it sounds like a great idea to do, but sometimes you're just including way too much when you do that. So, um, you know, you're still going to include that article. I just don't try to make it come up in the search. Um, just, you know, it's, it wasn't written very well, if that's what they did. Um, but and, and I say that kind of as a general rule, and sometimes I have to add in these extra terms like that and hope that my other ands that I'm adding in will help to mitigate like the excess that I might get from doing that. But I think some of these are just way too kind of general, like just therapy, that's kind of huge. Um, the other thing that they added into this um, was that might not be helpful according to what Cochrane is looking for, is at the bottom of this is these are all their outcome terms because um, they were looking at the effect of exercise on depression. Um, and it could be that they, they did that because they were getting back too many if they didn't add this in, but this is where that um, it's you're putting outcomes into your search. And the reason why Cochrane says don't do that is because um, we know from reading lots and lots of abstracts that people don't always put all the outcomes that they looked at in the abstract and you would be kicking out things that potentially did do this. So I think there's a combination of issues with the search, but overall, I mean, you can see that they added and they did a lot of work on this. Um, I think just some tweaking could have made it better. And I'd have to play with that last one to find out why they decided to put outcome in there. I bet it was because of the high numbers that they got back. Okay, um, so this is a little bit similar list to what I had before, um, but because in this one where we're looking at physical activity, I thought I'd put in a sport discus, um, which covers um, all areas of sport. Um, I know not every library has access to this. 
Um, I was the health and kinesiology librarian for many years, and I, I work with a lot with the physical education and kinesiology group. So I learned a lot about sport discus doing that. Um, so um, it's just one that you could think about for this topic. Um, and then I would start talking with them and listing out different conferences um, that we might want to make sure that the database were um, searching for conferences covers those and where might they be or, or do we need to do some hand searching with that so we start working through that and like I said we'll do more about that next time too um, and so here we started to build the search um, one thing that I had with this group um, is um, we went back and forth on listing out different types of exercise so did we want to list walking or, um, you know, different sports and things? Um, and so it was something that we played with here in the beginning. And so um, next time we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more. But it was something that we did talk about. And uh, one of the tags in um, one of the articles they gave me was walking as well. So sometimes was um, – some specific activities that you're trying to target. You may have to especially call them out. Um, so it was something that we discussed. Oh, the number of ADJ and Boolean operators that you can do. Um, so, that's one reason why I like to do line by line searching because I want to know have I done something that I'm getting zero back because if I would have nested it too much then I might not know that that particular grouping that I did wasn't giving me any results back. Um, I haven't gotten too many errors back from Ovid because of my nesting of adjacency terms. I have gotten that back many times from EBSCO and other databases um, that, that don't like it to be complex. But I have, uh, most of the time my errors I get back from Ovid are um, mostly my fault because the parentheses always get me. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I do a lot of line by line um, searching is just so that I can test that. Um, that that's a great question. Um, so I will talk with, and I talked a lot with this group about their protocol. Um, we talked about um, places where they could register their protocol and why would you register a protocol. Um, I gave them the um, Prisma now has um, an extension for protocols um, that's really nice, um, kind of lays out what to expect. It's always nice when you can give somebody a handout that you didn't have to make um, and all this and the steps are there um, and protocol also links people into um, Cochrane's handbook on protocols and gives some information there. So um, for this one, I'm going to show you, um, we did register this as a protocol. Um, we should probably go in and do a little bit of updating here. Um, we have submitted this to get um, published. So, um, uh, and we submitted this back um, last year um, in Prospero. So Prospero is completely free. Um, it's an international organization that collects systematic review protocols that have a health-related outcome. Um, so if you're just looking at like a methods of studies, they, they don't accept those type, um, which that's a type I do a lot of. Um, and it's basically a form that you fill out. They do have a nice PDF handout that goes through each, um, each um, step that you need to do. Um, and let's see, we've got a question from Eric. Um, I do like CREF that they do now have a place to put your protocol. I think right now they don't really have a set of standards of what they're looking for from a protocol, but I think it's, it's great. Um, I just showed uh, researchers yesterday all about um, CREF. So CREF stands for Systematic Reviews 
um, with animals and food science, food, something like that. I'm going to um, blink a little bit on that. Sorry. Um, I can add that list in the pre-reading um, if more of you are interested. Um, it's um, one of the founders was Annette O'Connor, and she's um, done a lot of work in um, meta-analysis and systematic reviews. Oh, thank you. Um, and um, it's a great place to go. They have um, articles in there talking about systematic reviews in animal health, um, and it's a place where you could publish your um, scoping or systematic review protocol. Um, so um, there are several reasons to publish a protocol. The first reason being um, the journal that you want to get published in requires that you register your protocol. Um, the second reason is part of scholarly communication. You're getting the information out there. Uh, it's a nice first win in a project, um, something to add to your CV. Um, it's not peer-reviewed. I, I just got that question yesterday. Um, but they do look at the kind of the quality of the reporting. They don't necessarily say, oh, you haven't searched all the right places. They might say, oh, did you list all the databases, that kind of thing, or um, they're looking for certain key pieces of information. Um, so I do encourage um, my clients to do this, um, and, and now several have done it in the last couple of years, so that's been great. Um, so you can kind of see where we, they listed out their questions, and they still put in that idea about the, the measures right up at the top. Um, uh, I tried to encourage them to put that third question up at the top because that really was their main question, but it's okay. Um, and then so you can see um, we have these certain types of studies, um, the condition, participants, so you can kind of see that PICO in there. Um, and then it goes on um, some more to look at, okay, what are the outcomes? Um, how are you going to do your data extraction? How are you going to look at risk of bias? Um, and so these are things that we're going to talk about as we go forward through the webinar. We're going to talk about these um, issues um, and I will try to bring up um, some issues that happen in these next steps, depending on if we're talking human medicine, veterinary, or public health, as I have crossed all of those. Um, uh, and especially recently, I've done um, three on, in cattle, so I've learned a lot more about um, veterinary literature and a lot about cows. Um, so we'll talk about these. but. Um, this is pretty much the end of the Prospero forum, so you can see it's not like really long. And sometimes, depending on how much people add into any one of these um, um, categories, you, it may be a few more pages. Um, but for for most people, this it's not too scary. I give them the handout, we talk about it, um, and if they'll work on this through the before we start collecting everything and sorting everything, I find that they have a much better um, success rate um, in actually completing it because they're not just doing sorting and um, not seeing anything coming out of that. Um, do you have any questions about Prospero or, um, or this, or this um, case study? I tried to leave um, plenty of time to answer questions. Okay, um, so um, if you Google Prospero and you also put a systematic review in there, you'll see it. Um, I can also paste in, I'm sorry I didn't add that on this page, I'm just realizing why didn't I do that. Um, here we go. I'm pasting the link to it here. Um, this is, and we talked about this a little bit last time as well because it is a place where you can go if you're trying to see has somebody else already worked on this topic. Um, you want to not just look for system, um, completed systematic reviews, um, but also um, you want to look for protocols. Um, 
So I don't know that about that question about the copyright. Um, I personally don't mind if somebody uses my search, um, but I know sometimes what you'll see in there is they'll just give um, a description of the search, but not the actual search. Um, and this, I remember this group now, um, they decided that they didn't want to share the search that I designed, so they just, um, we just described it this way. Um, sometimes you'll see where they describe it kind of where they're just listing out the concepts and the places, and then there'll be a link. Um, Prospero, you can also upload a PDF of it. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, get, I guess I get your concern. Um, I, just, I just don't personally worry about it myself. So I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> um, you would hope that if they went in here and they copied something that they would give you credit because of where they saw it. So, and definitely, um, I, I don't think that I said this. Um, if I use anybody's search, whether it's a search filter or um, I found like a previous review and they had a great hedge in there for something, I will always want to cite them. Um, I think that that's an important thing to do, whether it's, you know, it's this is our property, our intellectual property, right? So, so I, I understand. Yes, always, always, always document your sources. Um, and I think it's nice, you know, um, to um, cite um, somebody else's search and be, and it's great if we started seeing that more often. Um, I think many times what many of us do is we don't have time to go and look for other people's searches and we just keep reinventing the wheel. I, I think that that's what really happens more often than not. Okay, um, so free databases and resources, libraries that don't have the budget for Ovid. Um, so yeah, Ovid as an interface is very expensive. So of course there's PubMed, right? Um, I guess it would depend on what your what your topic was and, um, as to where else and what other free databases you should search. Um, and it's not that PubMed is, you know, terrible or anything. It's just you have to, um, some things aren't as efficient searching um, in PubMed, I, I have found. Um, um, so databases that cover dissertations besides PsycInfo. Um, so I do a lot of, I've done a lot of searching in ERIC, so ERIC covers them. I believe CINAHL does as well. Um, of course, if you want to go directly to a bigger list, you could look at dissertations and thesis. Um, to pe you know, it used to be um, that many more universities had their students register and publish in ProQuest. I know I had to do that when I did my thesis. Um, and now some universities are getting away with, are getting away from that, and they're doing more publishing in their own repositories, and so there's other um, dissertation um, databases have been popping up because of that issue. Um, next time, um, when we talk about expanding the search, I'll, I'll have a few more of those um, examples for you. So we're going to cover um, all those other places of searching, we're going to talk about um, searching uh, um, uh, dissertations and conferences. Um, I'm just blanking. The clinical registries, things like that. So, um, oh, yeah. So it's like as as soon as you get used to anything, it changes, right? Um, <laughs> so I'll be curious to see what new what new things they do. Um, I guess the other thing for me and PubMed is, um, you know, it's it's great for um, 
for searching because I can I can throw my words in there and I get stuff back. Um, but I just would like to have the most control as I can over my results and just try and be efficient. But you know, if that's what you have, that's what you have. So yeah, so there's a lot of um, free dissertation. There's a lot of um, different um, groups out there collecting dissertations, and there's there's more to think internationally. There's a European collections, different things like that. So. Okay, so what's the point of listing the years of coverage for the entire database? So if you are saying, if you are not going to apply any year limit um, and somebody's not familiar with that database, that's a reason why to give them the year coverage. Um, if you think about it, you know, doing a systematic review, it's a study of studies, and when you're presenting your search, you're kind of saying, this is where I got my sample from. And so you're trying to express to your reader how much was covered from this. Um, and, and so in some databases, everybody has access to the same amount of years for that database, so maybe you don't need that as much. And then with other databases, maybe you only have from a certain year forward, whereas another library might have further back. So I think just to be as fully transparent as they can, that's the main reason why they do that. <laughs> These are great questions. Free repositories of systematic reviews. Um, so um, for a while there was PubMed Health, and that was a, a nice collection of systematic reviews, and then they decided to kind of reabsorb everything back into PubMed, so, um, so you've got that. Um, there's all kinds of little subgroups depending on your on your topic that are collecting um, reviews. Um, for a while there, I used um, the TRIP database. I, I'm going to blink on exactly their acronym. Um, but then they, they kind of changed up, and I think now it has a subscription to it. So I used that for a little bit. Um, there's Pedro, which is great for physiotherapy. Um, so I, I've gone there. Um, so sometimes you find like little pockets depending on your topic. And so that's where it can kind of get specific as where should I look for reviews on this topic? It's, um, it can sometimes get kind of specific. And some of them aren't very big. I know that there's one, it's systematic reviews about uh, culture and sport management, which is really specific. Um, that was interesting to me that there was even a database for that. Um, so it can really depend. Um, perhaps I can um, I can add that link to the ones that I've collected um, for next time to show y'all. So we're going to keep building on the search throughout this whole uh, the webinar series. Uh, each time, getting a little further in, into um, more in different um, areas. So I'm just trying to give y'all a glimpse into what I do. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. So we've got about five more minutes. Any other burning questions? <laughs> Of course, y'all are welcome. Oh, I guess I should put up the slide um, for next time. Um, so we will continue in March. Um, I'm going to talk a lot more about um, the screening and selection process, and we'll also get into more of the expanded um, search. Um, and all those other kinds of areas that we've been talking about. Um, and so, and then if you can look at the pre-reading and then let me know your feedback. I'm always, I like to look through that and see what further questions. Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> um, thank you, Peggy. Um, 
And so I look forward to hearing from you and, and what further questions that you have. Um, also, we'll say that um, for many years, uh, I didn't use any tool but RefWorks to do my sorting. I'd come up with kind of a, a way of using folders and things and the way that I shared RefWorks with others that I found really helpful. Um, and when RefWorks decided to go with their new um, their new version, I couldn't do those same things in there. So that's when I started hunting and that's when I found um, Rayon. And then um, just uh, this weekend, I watched a webinar about the new updates that are coming to RefWorks. Um, they even mentioned systematic reviews when they were talking about that. Um, it's interesting because I had a conversation with RefWorks, oh gosh, 10 years ago telling them these are the things you could do to fix it, <laughs> to make it easier. Um, and it looks like they, they've they actually um, done some of those things. I think it's going to be um, kind of phased throughout the year, so I'll be looking for that. Um, and if they do make the changes that they were talking about and if it works out, I do plan on coming, um, maybe moving back into using um, RefWorks for doing that. Um, I've used, a, I've tried Zotero in a couple of projects, never any projects that were very big. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I just, I think the problem was that my understanding of Zotero wasn't that great. I would love to work with somebody who knows it well and we could figure out um, if it's helpful. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I kind of gravitated towards Zotero because I no longer had to tell somebody oh, you have to use EndNote or RefWorks or Zotero or whatever, um, that they could use whatever they wanted because we would just do some screening in Rayon and then move things into their favorite um, product. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking about that as well. So I might not be able to use it, RefWorks again for all of my projects because I do work on a lot of projects with people who don't use RefWorks or aren't affiliated with our university or things like that. Um, but plenty do, and it and it might be um, might be worth it to kind of stick with it there. So um, so just kind of putting that out there is something that I just saw. Um, students always ask which is best. Uh, so um, with with uh, rough works or in the yeah, that's a question I get a lot. So um, you know, all of these products are all designed to do the same thing, um, and. I'm kind of spoiled, I'm at a university where we have access to both. And so what I tell the students is, you know, they are all designed to do the same thing. Use the one that causes you the least headache, but here's why I like RefWorks. And I can understand why people would use EndNote or Zotero. Um, so I just kind of go over, um, go over what the, the differences are. Um, I have looked at Abstractor. Um, it's been a little while since I, I used it. Um, and I think that they have updated it a lot since last time I was there. Um, I know when I went in there before, I was having a hard time uploading things that were not from PubMed, um, but I could be wrong about that. And, you know, like I was saying with um, with Rayon, that there's a lot of other products out there. There's Abstractor, Distiller, Covidence, some cost money and some don't. Um, and there's more popping up all the time. And um, so the SR toolbox is a great place to go. Um, so I think we're almost, I think we're at the end. I want to make yeah, sure that Sarah gets, Margaret. sure. <laughs> there's, there's some really great questions in the chat box and I will make sure um, to, to get them all to Margaret so that she has them and so she can maybe address them at the beginning of next session. Um, but I do want to be respectful of people's time. So we do have a couple of final housekeeping items if y'all would stick around for just a few more moments. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording, but first a big thank you, of course, to Margaret for another wonderful session. Thank you so much, Margaret. Oh, sure. And thank you for everybody coming and asking such great questions. I always learn so much from y'all. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll do some of our final housekeeping.